So, hey, good morning, Dot. Welcome to our channel, Team Square. It's really a pleasure. In fact, I'm very highly obliged to have you on my show. And this is our very first show and technical talks. And we are having you as our very first guest. And it's really honored to have you here. Welcome aboard. Well, thank you very much, Neeraj, and thank, thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored, especially to be your very first guest. So thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for that. So I think our all the audience pretty much have heard your name. Not, I'm pretty much sure that more than 90% people wouldn't have seen you. And this is really great opportunity for me to bring to you the whole the world that this is what Dorothy Graham looks like. And she is the lady who has been making testers across the world to do the best way, right? So would you like to tell us more about yourself? Um, well, <clears throat> I'm originally from the States and my first job was at Bell Labs in New Jersey as a programmer. <coughs> and I was put into a test group. That's how I got into testing. And I was told to write two programs, one to run some tests and one to compare the results. So I got into test automation as well by accident, right at the beginning of my career. Um, my husband was British and we then moved to the UK and I worked for Ferranti for seven years, again, as a programmer doing police command and control systems, but I was interested in doing better testing. Uh, then I went to the National Computing Center. I went uh, self-employed when my, my daughter arrived. And, um, but I, I realized that testing was a bit of a neglected area. So I decided that um, I would try and specialize in testing because I thought it needed to be um, more prominent than it was. It was tended to be thought of as a necessary evil and anybody could do it. So um, I was given the opportunity at the National Computing Center to write some new courses. So I did a lot of research and testing. So I learned a lot about testing that way. And um, yeah, I just, I've always been passionate about testing and interested in testing. And it's certainly been a, an amazing ride. <laughs> I'm, I'm very grateful for the things that have happened to me. I certainly didn't plan my career. Somebody up there planned it for me much better than I would have done. Um, <laughs> but it's been quite an exciting ride, really. All right. So how did you get the inspiration to talk about your book, right? How did you, you know, start thinking of writing a book about ISTQB certification? Well, the first uh, certification for testers was actually done, uh, the first course was run in 1998. Uh, and myself and Mark Fuster, we were Grove consultants at the time, ran that very first course. It was done with the British Computer Society uh, ISEB, Information Systems Examination Board. And there was an exam with it and the first certificates were issued to the people who passed it on that course. <coughs> but that was a British initiative. Um, we had tried to get the Americans interested in it at some of the conferences there, but they didn't seem all that keen, but we went ahead anyway. And the success of the software testing scheme, ISEB had a number of other qualifications as well, project management, software development, and so on. Um, and the software testing was really successful. And then other people began to show an interest in it. And uh, at that time, we thought about writing a book to support the syllabus and the qualification. And I took it to the publishers who published the other books that I had done, and they weren't interested. <laughs> because they said, oh, it's a niche area, you know. And, uh, so they, they didn't see the fact that it was going to be something really big. Um, but then uh, ISTQB was formed, I think it was officially 2006. And then the software testing qualifications really went big time. And I was approached by Rex Black and Eric from Dean and Dahl uh, and Isabel Evans to write the book with them. Um, this time, of course, people realized that it was um, going to be quite a big deal. So there was a publisher who was interested in publishing it. So that, that's how I became in, involved with it. <coughs> and Isabel Evans was a co-author for the first edition, uh, but then she dropped out after that. So it was just the three of us, Rex and Eric and myself. And we're now on the fourth edition. I just happened to have that one here to show you. <laughs> I think yeah. the one you had, I have the other three editions as well on my bookcase. Um, and that one was done, um, sort of finished off during lockdown. So that's the most recent syllabus. And a new edition of the book has to come out whenever there's a new edition of the syllabus. And the syllabus has changed over the years because of course testing has changed. So the initial syllabuses that we wrote back in the day, I was also on the committee that wrote the first ISTQB software testing syllabus. Um, and Eric was on that as well. And that was, um, Yes, we had some meetings in London to try and thrash out what, what we thought would be the best things to put into that syllabus. But of course, 
back, back in those days, Agile wasn't really a thing yet, back in the early 2000s. So the syllabus changes in response to what's happening in the world. Um, no, it's, so it's always a little bit behind, of course, uh, because it takes a while to bring out a syllabus and then you bring out all the, the exams and all the training courses and the books and so on. But it's a, it's a basis for understanding. Sure. And no matter the book has been really great, doing pretty well. I, I personally have to share my own feedback that I think me being as a newcomer to the IT industry, let me tell you the secret. I come from a mechanical background. I'm a mechanical engineer myself. <laughs> and I, I wanted to move into software testing. And that is where I thought where to start with. So I thought somebody recommended me, some of my you know seniors recommended, hey, you got to take some certifications with you, which will give you a great foundation. Also some recognition so that you can add to your portfolio before you start approaching companies, right? So uh, they said, hey, there's a book called as, you know, Dorothy Graham, you just go ahead. So I said, the book name is Dorothy Graham? He said, yes, it is called as Dorothy Graham, <laughs> Dorothy Graham. And I was like, oh, really? So you just search by that name and you get the book and that's the best book in the world right now to learn about software testing. I said, okay. And literally when I, bought that book here back in India, started learning about it, went through the syllabus. It was more of like the way somebody's teaching you, not you're reading a book, right? The language, uh, the information is so driven that you can just do a self-paced learning. And I pretty much understood the way it was taught. Much more, I can say that kind of, I got the inspiration from there about teaching somebody. Right. This is how you don't put things like when you're sitting on a desk, somebody comes and asks you that, hey, this is what I want to do. You don't tell. OK, click there. No, you tell them the process that, oh, OK, you navigate here. You click on this. Why would you click on this? What happens if you don't click on this? So I got all that approach from there. So that's where the inspiration, you were the inspiration or the book was the inspiration for me to start working on the teaching part. So that's really good to know. Thank you so much about sharing the history and the inspiration about how you wrote the book. Now let's talk about the certification itself. Sorry. A joint publication and Eric and Rex have done, I mean, when we were updating the books, one of us would do the major updatings and the others would do extensive reviewing. So it is not just my book. But of course, <laughs> I'm so pleased to hear that it that you found it um, easy to take in and that it did help you. Um, and I mean, I've always loved teaching anyway. I was originally going to be a school teacher. Um, so I've oh. always liked trying to help people learn as you do, I think. Yep, pretty much. Thank you so much for that. And so let's talk about the certification. What kind of importance today after kind of, you know, two decades when we talk about ISTQB and there's a new generation stepping into software testing, there are software testers who are working but non-certified. So what kind of significance the certification has to our QA engineers? Well, that's a very interesting question. And I don't think there's any straight answer to it, to be honest. I think it depends on where you are, what the context is, where you're working or where you want to work. Um, <coughs> there are, I mean, when we first started the qualification, the attitude was there's nothing to learn about testing. So we wanted to have something, some sort of a, a bottom, bottom level that said, yes, I know something. But one of the things that happened when ISTQB first began to grow very quickly was that people began claiming more for it than it really was because people were saying, oh, if you just take this qualification, if you take this three-day course and pass this one-hour exam, you are an expert tester. No, you're not. You know a bit, it's related, it's removed the bottom layer of ignorance. So the uh, I'm a firm believer that this basic level is very important for all testers to understand, but it doesn't make you a tester. It makes you know something about testing. The only thing that makes you a real tester is doing testing and having the experience and practicing it. But the uh, uh, one of the things that, that happened, and one of the things, the reasons why we wanted to do the qualification was to get employers to recognize the fact that testers do have skills and do have knowledge. Um, and the qualification was a way for um, employers, if you like, to say, well, if they've passed that exam, they must know something about testing. So it did in effect, and particularly in some places, become you have to have this if you want a job. 
Yeah. And that's a little bit too much, I think, because really, if you're getting a job in testing, what you need to do is be able to test. And there are people who uh, do very good testing who are don't have the certification. And there are sure. people who have the certification, but who really don't do very good testing. I remember one of the early courses that we did, um, there was one lady who was, a, she'd been a tester for many years and was recognized by her peers as being an excellent tester. But she just was not good with um, book work, with, with exams and with things like that. And she actually failed the exam. And we were devastated because we knew she was a really great tester. And what the qualification proves is only that you've passed an exam. Yeah. And that's useful, but it's not everything. Got you. Uh, that was maybe a bit more information than you asked for. But. Of course, no problem at all. But this is what I think we, we, we are looking forward to understand that uh, the certification may not act as a kind of you know criteria for you, but there's equally the knowledge which you possess about doing the testing in reality. Uh, so it makes together a good combination. Right now, when you talk about the sample or kind of you know the syllabus which we talk about, how effective is the syllabus today? We do understand people are talking about agile. We have another certification in ISDQB for agile, right? But so what do you think? Like we're talking about traditional at this point of time, say for example, ISQB Foundation, is that still helpful for people to get started? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, and the, the, the current syllabus does um, talk about agile. Um, I mean, there's a chapter two is about life cycles and it does mention, um, well, incremental iterative development of which agile is the, is the main one. Um, so yes, it's, it does do that. But then there's the agile extension uh, or the, an extra two days on agile testing specifically. And then there's also the advanced agile tech, agile tester or technical tester. I'm not yeah. sure which one it is. Um, so yes, there are specific qualifications for testing in agile. Yep, great. Now we of course do have uh, amazing other certifications which people can always look forward to. Now, what do you think being given the approach creator uh, when you write something about the certifications, you pretty much know that, hey, this is how one should be aligned or sequenced in order to prepare for the certification. So what is your, you know, the best approach which you would like to share with all of us that, okay, in order to succeed with the examination, in order to get certified, what's the best approach to follow, to prepare on the syllabus at the same time, set up your mind to answer those tricky questions which comes in the examination, and what is these those any kind of you know tips and tricks which should somebody should take care of in mind? Yeah. So if if you want to get the qualification, how is the best way to get started? Um, one of the things that we were very um, keen about when we started this qualification is that the syllabus would always be free to anybody. And when we were working with the British Computer Society, we got into some arguments with them about that because they wanted to copyright it, and we said no way. So the syllabus has always been free and always will be free. In fact, the syllabi for any of the ISTQB courses, of which there are a lot now, are, are always going to be freely available. And if you want to take the exam, I mean, just getting the syllabus and reading through it is probably the best place to start because any training course that you take is going to be based on the syllabus and all the exams are going to be based on the syllabus. So the syllabus is really the key to the content of what you're going to be examined about. So, and just reading through it. I mean, if things don't make sense to you, well, fair enough, you know, make a note of which things don't make sense, which things do, and then you can maybe research a bit more. If you wanted to have someone take you through it, then going on a course is a good way to do it because then you're immersed in the experience, you're going through it step by step, you're getting feedback if you, when you're taking practice exams and doing exercises from uh, the, the lecture on the course, whether that's online or in person, not many in person these days, I don't think. <clears throat> um, and, and books as well can help to explain what's in the syllabus and give you further examples and things like that. But I mean, you only get the certificate if you pass the exam. So the exam questions are very important. And I think the best way to prepare for taking the exam is to do lots and lots of practice exam questions. And there will be practice exams, full sample papers available free from ISTQB and do work through those. And th there'll be practice exam questions. Exact, for example, in our book, we have sample, sample exam questions at the, at the end of every chapter. Work through those, 
do, do the questions first, then check if you got them right. And then if you didn't get them right, check the section that that was on to see if you can understand why you went for the wrong answer. And with the practice exams, once you got some practice with some of them, set yourself an hour or an hour and a quarter if English isn't your first language and you're taking the exam in English and set yourself the time and go through it as much as you can in the exam conditions. So a quiet room, no interruptions, bet on the kids or whatever, um, and sit down and just take the exam as though you were taking the real one. And it will sort of feel like the pressure of the real exam. You'd probably take the real exam online these days, but um, I think pra practicing with the exam questions, because the way the questions are constructed, there is one correct answer <clears throat> I'm talking at the foundation level here, of course. Uh, the more advanced levels have more complicated questions. But there's one correct answer, and the other three are actually called distractors. That's the technical term. They are right. intended to distract you from the right answer. So sometimes they are very hard to distinguish. I remember when I took the exam myself, there was one question I came back to about four times, and two of the answers. Those, those say the same thing, and I had to read it really carefully. Aha, that's the difference. And then I knew which was the right answer. So yeah, lots of practice on the exams, I think is probably a good thing. But of course, you won't get the exam questions right if you don't understand what the subject is anyway. So reading the syllabus and reading additional material will also help. Yeah, but pretty much makes sense because I think I've been telling the same thing to when people come back to me and ask me for the approach. With pretty much, I think I'm very well aligned with you now because I was not drunk. I'm just clarifying or verifying myself that when I used to tell people that, hey, take up the sample paper, try to answer it, where do you go wrong, go back to the syllabus. When I strongly recommend people to stick to the syllabus, adhere to the syllabus, that's going to help you. I think I was not wrong <laughs> because a person like you is also telling the same thing. That means, yeah, it's good. And uh, of course, the three options are distractors which pretty much tells you that, hey, if you don't concentrate, if you're not attentive to the options, they may all look correct. <laughs> and they, they are intended to make you go for them. They might use a word that's used in the question, but in the wrong way or something like that. Yeah. It's in fact, it's all writing the questions. After yeah, I had a go at in all my questions. sessions, I pretty much tell that, you know what, ISTQB spends more time creating their options than the question. <laughs> Yes, yes. I mean, the, the right answer is usually easy to write, but it's really hard to write a question that where the other options, you know, like testing is good, yes or no. I mean, that, it doesn't really help anything. Of course. And that's especially so, when you're talking about certificate of profession. Are, yeah, to write a question that's far too easy, that's yeah. fairly easy to do, or to write a question that's far too complicated, <laughs> that's also easy. To do getting the right level for the questions is a real skill, and I have a lot of admiration for the people who write the questions for these exams. Right, and of course, you don't see the real questions. The practice questions are written by a similar process and possibly by the same people, um, so they will be similar, but they certainly won't be the same, or at least are they you? shouldn't be. True. Now, what do you think? Uh, what kind of experience uh, one should have in order to? take it as a qualifier or kind of, you know, adding as a value to their portfolio. What I mean here is I have trained people who are in their final year of graduation. They succeeded with the exam. I have trained people who were kind of taking an institute course and trying to get certified before looking for a job. I've also trained people who are already like having four, five, seven years of experience and wanted to take up these certifications just to add more value. To their portfolio. Now, what do you think is the best time or is there a best time for taking this certification? It's interesting that it seems like you took it before you started in testing. So you were <laughs> one of the people who took it without, without any experience. Correct. I think we put, um, when, I'm not sure if it still says that, but we, we said at the beginning that when you are, um, the ideal time, if you have, say, six months experience in testing, so you're still new to it, but at least you've had some idea of how testing works in the workplace, <coughs> then that's probably a, a good, good thing. But it's not a requirement. You don't have to have any experience in testing. Um, and it's interesting. I've, I have also trained people who've had either no experience, a little experience, and even quite a lot of experience, because when the certification was new, people who had been in testing for a long time still wanted to get the certification to add it to their um, portfolio, to their CV. 
And it, it's interesting that even the people who've had a lot of experience usually found something new and interesting in the course, even though they knew a lot of the basics already. Some, sometimes for people, uh, especially we've had some people who are new to IT taking the, the and, and they struggle. Uh, yeah. I suppose there's an assumption that you know something about IT and maybe having a bit of knowledge about programming is helpful, but not necessary. Um, so no, when you begin to do something and you find, I don't really understand how this works, then you've tried something and because it didn't work, you are then receptive to hearing, ah, well, this is perhaps a better way to do that. For example, using the techniques and you will take it in better if you've attempted it and now see that this is a better way than if it's just told to you and you don't understand that um, you, you haven't had the experience of not doing it well. You know what I mean? Yep, pretty much getting it. Now, given that you are here with us today, I don't want to miss an opportunity to talk to you about having some mindset of testing as well. Of course, certification is one part of it. You being a kind of, you know, the kind of person who has been doing a lot of things, a lot of workshops on testing, and you have been a tester yourself. We'd like to hear and understand more about like what should be the psychology of testers, right? The mindset, what exactly a tester need to possess? Because I keep getting a lot of these questions when people moving from, which you said like non-IT to IT, what kind of mind mapping they need, or there are, you know, I'm, I'm really surprised to see that we have become so good that developers are turning into QA now. <laughs> the era has changed, <laughs> exactly. And I, I feel really proud when they say that, I was developer for five years. Now I'm a QA. I'm sitting in an ISTGB session. I said, that's the best thing what I can hear, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so well, we want to understand from you, from your expertise, from your experience, that what basically makes a QA? Um, the, I think that the mindset that I've just come back from Eurostar last week in person in Copenhagen, it was wonderful. Um, but there were some, some talks and some discussions about mindset and about how, you know, what, are, what is the tester's uh, approach? Is it one mindset? Is it one for each person? And I think the tester's mindset is the most important thing about a tester. And the mindset is that of challenging things. It's that of saying, well, what could go wrong? And have you thought of this? And what about that? Reading everything in a, a user story or a requirement and saying, well, what if it isn't? Uh, rather than just assuming it's going to be the same. So uh, testing is very challenging. Not only is it dif you know, difficult enough to do that, it gives you a lifetime of work, but it's also, its work is challenging. And we challenge everything we're given. That's what the tester does. The tester doesn't take things, you know, to just accept them. It says, ah, oh, but what about this? And what, what about that here? And what about these two things together? And have you thought about that? And remember last time when something went wrong. So. That I think is the essential thing. Some people describe testers as professional pessimists, um, but I don't think it's necessarily pessimism, but it is certainly an awareness of how things might go wrong. And if you can anticipate how things might go wrong, then they don't, then you can prevent them going wrong. And, and preventing things going wrong is also a strong role of the tester. And the earlier testers are involved, the more that can happen. When uh, in the olden days, when there was waterfall life cycle models and testing was just an afterthought at the end, you built rubbish and then you found it wasn't working and then you had to fix it. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Now, if the testers are involved in agile development right from the start in the first sprint and in the discussions of the stories, assessing the user stories right at the beginning, they can come up with this, well, what if it isn't and have you thought of this before anything is built? And then therefore it gets built taking account of the things that might otherwise go wrong. And that's that's the, the tester's mindset, I think. Yeah, pretty much because it's more about if you know what are you testing, if you know what are you looking forward to, where people can go wrong, I think our test cases can be really more strong and more efficient as well as effective to find the defects, which is our core yeah. objective to do the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So uh, anyways, uh, what, what I would also want you to quickly check, uh, I've been getting a lot of questions about this and want to convey to you and hear from you. When you talk about the comparison between manual and automation, given the trend, the technologies are driving you towards more and more automation. What's the significance of manual still exist? 
that's what you hit on my one of my favorite topics. <coughs> First of all, I don't really like the term manual testing. And I think this term was invented by a tool vendor who wanted to degrade it. And if you think about manual labor, that's like, like brick building. I mean, brick building is a real skill, but it's not, it's not considered a high status skill. And I think that's why they called it manual testing. I prefer something like in-person testing or intelligent testing or um, active testing, um, because it's, it's, it's brain power testing, intelligent testing, because that's what it's doing. You're using your brain. And no matter, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm a great proponent of automation. I've written three books on it. And automation in testing is great for the things that can be automated. I think it was Alan Page who said, automate all the things that should be automated. He didn't say automate all the things. <laughs> and you see this on, I, oh, it really annoys me. I, I, there was one at uh, a sticker at Eurostar and I put a big crossing out thing on it. <laughs> no, you don't automate all the things. You automate what computers can do well, but you need people to do what people do well. And we don't have automated testing. Testing is far more than what can be automated. We don't have automated project management, do we? Let's automate project management and get rid of the project managers. Crazy idea because project management needs brain power, but project managers use tools. When I wrote my first report on testing tools back in the 1991, it was called the CAST report, Computer Aided Software Testing. And really that's a much better description of what testing tools do. They don't do testing, they aid testing. Yeah. And Automation is good and automation is necessary. And if you have a pipeline, you can't do it without good automation. And automation is superb for running tests, which have to be run over and over and over again, which people do not do well. They get bored, they make mistakes, and, and it's, it's mind numbing. But you don't want a numb mind when you're testing. You want an active mind. You want a curious mind. You want an investigative mind. And that's what testing is. Testing is not just pushing buttons. Testing is what do we need to test? How are we gonna test it? What examples are we gonna use? What data do we need to set up? What, what do these results mean? Maybe the, the comparison to the expected results says it matched, but maybe the expected results are wrong. A tool will never tell you that. A tool will never say, I wonder what happens if I do this. A tool only does what it's told. And yeah. testing is so much more than what can be automated. So I'm, yes, I'm very much in favor of automation, but that will never replace testing by people. People, if you have people as users, you will always need people as testers. Pretty much. I think that hits the answer exactly what I was expecting and uh, kind of like our audience will also understand that, hey, this is what the significance, what manual will hold and sustain because human minds cannot be replaced by robots. Absolutely. Robots can help you to minimize your efforts, but cannot replace you, right? Even, and I always say my audience. Yeah, even artificial yeah. intelligence will not yeah. replace people. Exactly. <laughs> now, I always <laughs> tell my audience when they talk about this quick comparison, I just tell them one line. Don't forget, an automation tool was tested manually. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, yeah. So you so cannot just replace it. Yeah, one of the things I put in, in fact, in the first cast report was if your testing is not good, if your testing is in chaos, automating chaos just gives you faster chaos. <laughs> exactly. It's more important to do testing well than to automate the testing that you have. Um, what, you know, good testing is better than bad automation. True, so true. You know, robots cannot have the intuition. <laughs> no, that's right. And one other thing about this is that at the moment when uh, people are recruiting testers, there's very much, it's very much popular now that um, testers have to be able to use the testing tools. And it, the ads for testers seem to all say, uh, what tools can you use? What tools do you have experience in? And that's not what's important. What's important is what testing can you do? Uh, at the Eurostar conference, one of the things I had was a, a 99 second presentation. A lot, several of the former program chairs had a chance to do that. And I would use the analogy, if you were gonna hire a chef, would you say, well, what knives can you use? And can you use big pans and little pans? And can you use gas and electric? And can you use these different brands of food processors? Well, that's not what's important if you're hiring a chef, it's what does the food taste like? And if you're hiring a tester, what tools can you use? It, it's, 
it's degrading in a sense to the skills of testing and it's exactly. ma making testers who don't want to do automation feel as though they're second class citizens. And I think that's wrong. I really object to that. I have no objections to testers who do want to use tools and are happy being both testers and developers, even if the development is just within the tools themselves. In fact, my son-in-law is a tester developer and that's fine. I have no objections to that. What I object to is telling people who are good testers that they're no longer good testers because they don't use tools. I think that's wrong. No, it is, of course. I think we just pretty much understand that tools are just a kind of, you know, add on to your intuition, your mindset, but what you can do, it just cannot be replaced by anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's just like an add on to build more value to your profile, but what you can think is non, you know, kind of replaceable. Yeah, the tools do, get the tools to do what people do badly and that, that tool, computers do well. Get the computers to do what computers do well and leave the people to do what people do well. And in fact, you know, when you talk about the AI testing, right? Artificial intelligence testing, of course, there was a mindset behind that to build the tool. <laughs> <laughs> so that yeah, intuition is always there. Yeah, artificial intelligence is a bit scary, I think. <clears throat> Again, there were presentations I've seen recently. Um, one at a conference with um, the Test Chat community. We did I did a conference with um, our Peter Swear on um, called Axiom, and one of the pr presentations there was on artificial intelligence. And she had a an example where you had an apple, and the artificial intelligence or the machine learning identified it as an apple with about. 93% accuracy or 95% accuracy. Then they took a sticky note, wrote iPod on it and stuck it on the apple. And the artificial intelligence then identified the apple with sticky note, 99% confident as an iPod. Exactly, that's where the human mind comes. No replacement. <laughs> yeah. So All right. How, so how you test the AI systems is really strange as well, because how, how do you test a system which is changing its answers all the time? Because it's learning. Exactly. You test? I don't know. But for some reason, we still say that automation is more reliable. <laughs> mm, automation is more repeatable. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much get it. All right. So, yeah, I think it, 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 re, it is really good to know all these things from you, Dor. And uh, we are looking forward to, you know, kind of, you know, share this information with all our audience. And we may look forward to connect with you to understand more because I know you have a great knowledge base with you. And of course, that small session, what we are just talking right now would not be enough to share that with the whole world, right? And uh, we may come back to you again to look forward. But before that, we'd like to know what is your message for today's QA, that how to become a better QA in yourself. If you have started working as a QA, you are looking forward to become a QA, what's that a QA should look forward to or what they should be keen about in order to build their QA journey more strong, more enthusiastic, more motivating? So what exactly do they need to do for that? What's your message to the QA? Um, well, I've always liked using the techniques and finding the best ways to test particular things. But I think one thing that's really important for people nowadays, it seems that still high level managers haven't got the message about the fact that testing is more than pushing buttons. I think work on communication skills, particularly learning how to communicate the value of testing to higher level management. Um, not, it's not just how many bugs have I found or how many tests have I run but try to find a way to say, this is the, the, the value of the testing that we've done. We have this level of confidence in the software, um, but these are still the risks. You need to talk to higher level managers in a way which is very much um, short and to the point, but is focused on the things that are important to them, which is normally the bottom line being the money. <coughs> and I think communication skills for testers are very important as well. As yeah, as currently as the lack. Mm. True. Now, I think I pretty much understand, and uh, we, in fact, have tried understanding a lot of things about what testers should be, what the certification is all about, who can look forward to it, and what not to think that ISTQB certifications are. It's not a qualification, it's more of like a, kind of a 
another add-on to your portfolio, but just don't look forward to it as a qualification or as a kind of you know criteria gateway to get into the testing. You always need to possess that mindset, possess that thinking that, hey, this is how a system can fail and look forward to prove that by your test cases. So put that intuition and thought process into your test cases and justify the system doesn't work, right? So certifications help you to boost your portfolio, but certainly just can't replace your mindset, right? Okay. Yes. And I think it's it's important as well. I think Michael Bolton and James Bach have done a lot of things on yes, uh, how to communicate the value um, of, of the testing. I think that's important as well. And yes, the qualification is, it tells you that you, it, it, it gives you a certain basic, perhaps respectability in some circles. And if it's a qualification for working at a particular company that you have the, the certification, then if you want to work there, you need to get it. Um, but it doesn't make you the best tester in the world. It just mm -hmm. means that you know a little bit about testing and you are now in a place to move your, your career forward by adding to the book knowledge, if you like, that's and the minimal sort of practical knowledge from the ISTQB qualification at foundation level to move forward to um, build your experience on that. And of course, ISTQB has lots of other qualifications as well, um, specialist ones and uh, advanced ones. Um, it's amazing how many qualifications they have nowadays. Yeah. If you look on the ISTQB website. Oh, and by the way, if there's a term, if you're reading through the syllabus and there's something you don't understand, the ISTQB glossary, which is the definitions of all the terms, is available online for free. And that's very useful to just look up definitions. Yeah, that's true. We always keep recommending our participants to make sure that make use of course the glossary to get all the terminologies and the naming conventions or definitions to that. That pretty much gives them a lot of booster to understand what exactly the syllabus is. All right, so I think, yeah, that, that, that's all what we had, uh, Dorothy, and thank you so much for sharing your time with us, more importantly, and of course, your great knowledge with all of us. We are really pleased to have you on our show, and we look forward to connect with you in future again, and I look forward to get as much as possible from your understanding of testing and uh, all that you can share with us. Thank you so much for taking some time out and joining us here. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for your very interesting questions. And I'm very impressed with what you're doing in testing and keep it up. I think that's great. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Thank you so much, Dorothy. And we'll look forward to connect with you again in future to come up with some different topics and talk about it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for your time once again.